Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, we're about to start in a few seconds, but a key reminder for everyone, please don't block the stairways just for fire hazard reasons and for the ease of everyone else coming into the room. Other than that, please give a warm welcome for Samantha Palazzolo. Hello, good morning. As she mentioned, my name is Samantha Palazzolo, and today I'm going to talk about using software-defined radio to analyze IoT devices, specifically wireless uh, protocols of IoT devices. So you have a device, it can be anything from you know, an IoT hub, a light bulb, a door lock, something, and, and you're not really sure exactly what's going on wirelessly, right? Like what kind of information it's sending, um, what's the format, things like that. So Software Defined Radio, or SDR, is a resource for gathering information on um, on what's going on over the air and what things are being sent. So the reason why I wanted to kind of give this talk is that I've been working with wireless communications for about five years, but I'm by no means an expert. I'm just, I do not feel confident with doing DSP, which is a very complex um, field. But at the same time, somehow I'm able to, using SDR, using some tools, I'm able to do these analyses. And I thought it would be worth sharing some of the tools and techniques that I use for individuals getting started in this area and who, who want to learn um, some, some basics for how you could go about doing an analysis like this. So these are the steps that I follow. Um, different people have different steps. This is just what we're going to go through today. Um, you start with gathering device information, um, checking. So this actually, these steps can apply to other wireless signals. The only thing I would kind of caveat, I would put that I sort of consider IoT specific is checking for basic RF replay. And I'll talk about what that means um, a little bit in a little bit. So um, another thing I want to point out is that when I talk about RF, I'm just referring to a wireless signal for the purpose of this talk. So if I switch between the two, that's what I'm talking about. So the first step, and I can't stress this enough, this really should be the first step for anyone looking at a wireless device, is gathering device information. So luckily in the US, uh, if something is radiating, uh, specifically, and, and even some things that are radiating just you know by computers will have to have um, an FCC ID. And this is very useful for information gathering. So when you go and you look up the FCC ID, either two, two of those sites will work. But you can get things like the frequency, the bandwidth, modulation, some of the basic information about the signal. But in addition, sometimes you'll be able, they always generally have internal photos. And sometimes they won't block out the chips that they're using. So you can actually get information there that you can use for other kinds of analyses of the device. Um, I even heard of, I've never seen myself, um, that you can get schematics in some cases. But the FCC ID lookup is probably one of the key, um, keys, key steps and will give you a lot of the information that you need for something like uh, wireless analysis. So the other things you want to collect as much as information as you can. There may be people who did previous research and have created tools for the device or protocol you're looking at, and even patents can be useful because they can tell you the formats, maybe some of the packet formats, or or how the the RF protocol is, is actually working over the air. So all of those things are really useful. So in order to kind of go through these steps, I'm actually going to use uh, an example system, and it's actually an ecosystem um, of devices that I want to go through. So uh, doing the first step. These are some of the examples of information that I was able to gain by, you know, doing FCC ID manuals and, and the like. So key features I wanted to point out is the center frequency, so 915 megahertz. That's telling me where to look. That's telling me what I want to focus on when I, when I actually um, do something with the SDRs. So the other two items that I've highlighted are the modulation method, FSK, frequency shift keying. Don't worry if you don't know so much about what that is. Um, it's something 
a Google search to learn a little bit, and Manchester line encoding. So those two are going to come up uh, in a little bit. So before we go any further, what is software-defined radio? What is SDR? So in my mind, there's actually two main components to an SDR. There's the hardware, um, and there are some examples there. And the hardware kind of has a frequency range it operates over. Uh, the few, I think the top three in general will actually have versions that have a range from 70 megahertz up to 6 gigahertz, and this covers a lot of the RF that interests people. Um, most things operate in there, you know, cellular, GPS, the unlicensed or ISM bands, a lot of stuff can be seen within that range. So the other thing about these devices is that some are transmit and receive, and some are only receive. So it kind of depends on what your purpose um, or what your use is for the SDR hardware, depending on what you want um, to use it for. And then the second part is the SDR software. So the software, um, a lot of the software is open source. And like I said, for everything, it, it kind of depends on what you want to use it for. So I'm going to specifically talk about, throughout my talk, um, GNU Radio and GQRX, which are two tools that I favor when I do analyses like this. But Everyone has their own setup, their own system that they like. It's just kind of over time, you try things out and see what works for you. So data communication channels for IoT device to SDR. And this is actually kind of a data communications channel for visual communications. Um, and I've kind of just modified it to show an example of what some of the steps we're going to end up going through in the talk. So we start off with, um, on the top, there's the SDR, or not the SDR, excuse me, the IoT device, and it has some kind of packet format. And the packet format gets broken down into bits, and then there's data encoding. And there's different kinds of data encoding. There's channel encoding, line encoding. And we're going to talk today about um, some line encoding with our example. Um, that was the Manchester encoding that I pointed out earlier. And so... Up to here, we have bits, right? But then we have modulation. And the modulation basically allows you to modulate that digital information and, and put it in an analog signal so you can send it over RF. Or you send it over the channel, which in this case is over the air. So what I want to point out about modulation is that we have these bits, but when you modulate it, you get symbols. So FSK has two symbols, a 0 and a 1. But something like 64 qualm or 64 quadrature amplitude modulation um, has 64 symbols. So it's just something to, to be aware of, is that it's not as simple bits to, you know, zeros and ones again when you do a modulation. And so you send this over the channel, and basically at the SDR you have to do the reverse. You have to demodulate, decode, and be able to get the packet data back out. So that's what we're going to try to step through at a very high level today. So before I go any further, another thing I wanted to make a note about is that if you're working with a known protocol, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, Zigbee, Z-Wave, you may not want to use SDR. You can use SDR. It's perfectly, you know, it, and it's not going to be necessarily easy. It's about, um, you know, there are tools for these uh, waveforms. But if all you're concerned about is the packet data, you're probably better off using specialized hardware. Now, there may be cases, for example, that they're using a different, an interesting frequency that you don't have hardware for, or following some kind of pattern that's not in the standard, or, or something to that effect. Or maybe there's something interesting about the RF. In that case, you know, SDR is what you want. Um, or if you just want to try your hand at this, that's perfectly all right as well. But um, SDR, you know, as I'm going through right now, is, is really good for kind of the unknown unknown signals, unknown proprietary uh, protocols. So the first step is to capture the signal. And there's a lot of different tools. Like I said, the, a lot of the software that I mentioned has some capturing a capability. And when you capture something, you really want to keep track of the settings that you use. Okay, um, some Over time, you'll figure out which ones are useful to you. but Things like, what frequency did you capture on? What's the offset? And I'll go over a little bit this in, with our example. Um, and the sample rate, how many samples per second is the hardware taking in the information? So these things are important to keep track of. Um, that'll help you later on in the analysis. So 
for example, I mentioned GQRX. This is one of my favorite tools to use for just getting started really quick. Um, if you have this installed on your system and there are instructions all over the internet about how to get this installed and working, uh, this you just would be able to plug in your SDR and get started. You can choose your SDR from the menu and get started right away. And you should be able to see signals. And there's even some analog demodulation that you can potentially do. You, if, I think the easiest thing to do with this is to put something in, go to one of the radio stations, and see if you can hear that, see if you can demodulate that. Um, so this is our signal. And if you remember, I said it was uh, 915 megahertz. So my center frequency is actually 914. And the reason why is that some SDRs um, hardware will actually have a little bit of a signal at DC or at the center frequency. And in order to avoid that and have that not be an issue for my signal, I have uh, an offset, right? A one megahertz offset. So I know what my offset is. It's one megahertz. Um, and we see this signal here, it's FSK. So it's got the two bunny ears, right? Uh, and that's our two symbols, right? Frequency shift keying, each frequency designates one sim symbol. So one frequency is a zero, one frequency is a one. And it's modulating, and that's what I expect to see. So when I see this signal, and I've looked up online, like what does an FSK signal look like? That's what I should expect to see, or something similar. Um, and finally, we have the sample rate. Um, just to keep in mind, and, and you'll see coming up why that's important. So, the next step is check the basic RF replay. So, what is what do I mean by this? Um, it's actually a sanity check, and I'll explain a little bit why. Um, but an RF replay means that you've captured the signal, right? And you're just going to replay that signal on the same frequency with one of the, the SDRs that will transmit, and you're going to get the same command executed by the device. So this generally shouldn't happen. Like we know that you know if you think door locks um, are not door locks, uh, garage door openers, right? Replaying the signal and opening it, uh, anyone can get into your house. Things like that. We've known about this. There's like rolling codes and other things that prevent basic replay from happening. But as I'm sure many of you are learning with IoT devices, you can assume that they've followed best practices when they've created these devices. So this is kind of a sanity check. And before you transmit, you really want to make sure you're following FCC rules. Uh, and if you're really not sure, RF enclosures are your best bet. So just for safety's sake. Um, so to do an RF replay, uh, this is GNU Radio Companion. This is a flow chart. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, GNU Radio Companion in a bit. But we basically have the file, we have a throttle. And the throttle is important because if you don't have a throttle when you're replaying a signal, and uh, GNU Radio, it will try to play the signal back as fast as possible, right? And it's just kind of jumbled up and not what you're looking for. So you want to say, I captured at, you know, our case was eight mega samples per second. So you want to make sure you're throttling at eight mega samples per second. So it's going back at the same um, speed. And then there's just the sync. In this case, this is your SDR. I also personally like to have a, a visual sync so I can like see what I'm transmitting or, or the timing. It's, just a preference. So the reason why I have this in here in the first place is that even before doing the protocol analysis, right, like we didn't do anything to signal. You don't have to know anything about the signal. You just captured it and you replayed it. Um, as a joke, our example system, I tried this with some light bulbs. I was like, oh, let me record the signal and play it back and see what happens. And guess what? Light turned on and off. And I was like, OK, that's weird. Um, not a big deal, though. I mean, your light turns on and off. Maybe doesn't affect you too much. But turns out that you can integrate something like a door lock into the system. And even though the door lock is has its own security mechanisms, because it's integrated into this um, other ecosystem that doesn't have protections against replays, you can replay a signal that can unlock and lock a door. So. You know, this is a sanity check. By simply figuring out if this is possible, you've, you've learned something about the system. Um, so that's basic replay attack. So the next step, and I think this is, in my opinion, one of the more difficult steps, is the protocol analysis. So we have this captured file, and we need to do the reverse. We need to, so we capture it on the SDR um, system with the hardware. And now we have to do some kind of demodulation and data decoding, and eventually we want packets. So it's kind of 
daunting, I think, if you think about it. But there are a lot of tools that can really help you with this uh, analysis. So, and I'm going to step through some of them. So, one of the tools, and I recently learned this one, and I think this thing is awesome, is InSpectrum. So, InSpectrum allows you to, to see the signal. And this is just, by the way, a piece of the signal. There's, you can scroll um, over horizontally and look at um, the rest of it. But you wanted to put, you would open up your file and put in the sample rate, right? The sample rate keeps popping up over and over. It's, it's something important. And you can uh, look at the signal. And actually, for the system that we're looking at, the FSK system, you can see the FSK. You can see these two like parallel rows. That's two different frequencies. And it's a 1 and a 0. Um, so if you wanted to, using this um, program, you could do something like a clock recovery, figure out what, out what the bits are, and go from hand and do the rest of that. Um, the rest of this piece. But it's probably, it's an interesting exercise, but you may not want to do it by hand. Um, but it's still a really great tool, and, and you can learn a lot by looking at the spectrum and trying to figure out clock cycles. And I'll figure out, I'll explain what I mean by clocking in a little bit. So the next step is demodulation. And this is a really kind of confusing flowchart. And I want to kind of say right now that I did not come up with this flowchart. I actually, Mike Osman, who I will speak about in a little bit, is the one who gave me this, and I modified it to my needs. And that's kind of something I really want to stress, is that there's a lot of help, um, a lot of people who really want to encourage individuals to get into this area and help them with the work that they're trying to do. So there's not, you don't have to come up with everything on your own. So. We'll break down exactly what this is. So we see this throttle again, right? Because we want to make sure that we're sending at the right sample rate. And then there's this, this translating filter. So what this filter does is, if you remember, I had the 914 megahertz was my center signal, right? But I'm interested in 915. So it will shift kind of the focus of the signal, and then it will do a low-pass filter and say, I only want to look at this part of the frequency. Because you don't want to see the rest. You don't want to analyze the rest. You don't care. You only are interested in your particular signal. And so the orange is actually, um, what it does is it breaks down the signal into different burst packets. Um, so each burst has its own file. And by a burst, what a burst is, if you remember from the in-spectrum graph, you had the, it was an obvious signal, right? FSK signal. Well, the rest of the signal is, is not interesting, right? It's nothing's being sent. And you don't really, you don't want that incorporated into your analysis as much as possible. So what this does, and this is kind of the key piece that Mike uh, gave me, and, and I'll explain later why this, why, why this was necessary, is that this, each of those bursts is generally a packet or maybe two packets. So we're dividing it up into packets um, in the file. And then this little green, box is the demodulation, right? Like, I, this is a demodulation slide, but, like, the demodulation box is one little guy there. Well, there's a little bit you have to do um, in processing and dealing with the signal in order to get there. And the other thing you may notice is, so I'm demodulating FSK, but the block itself says quadrature demodulation, or it's quadrature demod. Um, so the way you would kind of figure this out, if you're not familiar, I mean, there's a DSP reason why, but you would just say, you would just Google, I want to use GNU radio to demodulate FSK. And you'll find out, everyone's like, oh, just use the quadrature demodulation. This is what you would want to use for that kind of signal. So the next step is this line decoding. And if you remember, it's Manchester. And you don't really know need to know much about Manchester. I mean, you can look that up. But the important piece to understand about Manchester is that you need a clock to generate Man Manchester. And so when you do the reverse, you need to recover the clock to be able to properly decode a Manchester en encoded signal. So clock recovery is actually probably one of those difficult areas for a DSP. There's actually a block that you can use for GNU radio, but I've heard um, tons of complaints about it. It's, it's really difficult to use, um, and people have a hard time with it. So you know, I could have struggled through that and, and probably, you know, with help, been able to figure it out. But it turns out that Mike Osman, who I mentioned before, actually wrote a program that will do this for me. And that's why that, that other demodulation chart was so complicated, because we wanted to get bursts of data. 
these these file um, different files that is an individual burst. And the reason why is he wrote a Python script and it's available at GitHub that basically takes in that file and will do a clock recovery and get me the Manchester um, bits. It, it takes a while to run, but it's really great. Um, it's interesting that the analysis that I'm kind of stepping through, at the time I was kind of stuck. And at uh, the GNU Radio Conference last year, he presented this tool and I was like, that's what I need. So it saved me a lot of effort and it's a really great tool um, if, if you're doing this kind of analysis. So we have this clock recovery tool, we get um, the bits out, so then what do we do? So eventually, as I said, you want to get back to this packet data. And if you did your information gathering, hopefully you, you got a format of some sort. But the thing about the formats and going from you know the, the decoded bits into this format is it's not always straightforward. It can be kind of a daunting task. But you know some people are more comfortable. Now that you have the bits, you can manipulate them and, and do things with it. For me, I'm, this, this part kind of scares me a bit. Um, and I'm, and I kind of knew from looking at the code that what I gathered, the information I gathered, did not seem to fit quite uh, what I what I was seeing in the the output of the uh, clock recovery program. So, well, it turns out someone has already done an analysis on the protocol I was looking at, and I had discovered this tool during my data gathering. I tried to use it because this tool, this is Peter Shipley presented this at DEF CON, and this tool would actually uh, live decode this protocol. I would be able to use SDR, pick it up, and decode it, and, and just spit it right out. And I couldn't get it to work. I tried, and just there was something about it that didn't work with my, my hardware. So I set it aside. But once I had Mike Osman's work, I was able to say, wait a second, that Manchester encoded bits, those look like the input into part of his, part of his tool. So I was able to go back and not use his whole tool, but use part of it to extract the packet information I was looking for. So this is something really important, you know, as I stressed before, is that, yes, I could have probably struggled and done it um, myself. It's always possible. But more and more, as the SDR community grows, people are, are doing this research and, and pursuing these protocols and finding out information. And there's a good chance that someone has already looked at the protocol you're interested in. And doing that search will kind of give you those those baselines um, information to start with. And even if you can't you know, run their code, maybe there's pieces of the code that you can realize somewhere else to be able to get the information that you need. So in summary, I mean, the things that I really wanted to, to iterate today is that SDRs are an inexpensive way to, to do radio. Um, actually, one of my coworkers, he said that the physical or file layer is brought into the cyber realm using software-defined radio. So it basically takes that RF, right, this, this um, information that's floating around that you can't really even see unless you have a special equipment, and it allows you to get it into bit form and manipulate it that way. Uh, and the other, the other key piece is that there's a really great community to reach out to. Uh, if you're willing to learn and you're having trouble, there's a bunch of different mailing lists. I mean, my favorite is GNU Radio, but um, there's a bunch of different mailing lists that you can reach out and say, listen, I've tried all of these things and I'm stuck and I need help. And there's a good chance that someone will help you. Um, they really, the community really wants to encourage individuals to, to join and learn. And all levels are invited. You know, even someone, you, you don't have to have, as I was saying, a DSP background or even a coding background to, to have interest and want to, to learn about this. And finally, analyzing a wireless protocol doesn't need to be an overwhelming task. Um, everything that I did, of course, you could do from scratch, and, and people do. But at the same time, there's so much work out there right now and, and in the recent years, it's just kind of exploded in the number of people doing work in this area. But there's a good chance that whatever you want to do, someone has at least started or has a baseline for you to begin off of. Uh, and the last thing I wanted to point out is a couple guides that I recommend, and there's, there's tons more. But uh, Mark Newland and Matt Knight gave a great 
talk at ShmooCon this year that was kind of sort of what I gave, but they had their own version or their own take on, on this process. And it's worth, like, it's worth learning about how other people go about their analyses. And, um, yep, and the GNU Radio tutorials are great if you go and check those out. And I know that the GNU Radio um, community is always interested in input. So if you if you go and you look at the tutorials and you're like, hey, you really should explain this more, or, you know, I'm looking for information about this, I'm sure they would appreciate that kind of feedback. So um, with that, are there any questions? Yes. Let's see. I honestly, I don't remember because every time I use this the FIR filter, I have to go relook up how to use it again. And there's great tutorials. I'm sorry, I couldn't. <laughs> yes, sir. Yeah. 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 So um, that's that's a good question. So my recommendation would be to get the RTL SDR, um, and there's different versions of it, and it's relatively inexpensive. I think twenty, thirty bucks uh, on Amazon. And for software, actually, I, I forgot to mention, GNU Radio has a GNU Radio Live. CD that you can download and use. And you plug it in and you boot from that CD and it has a lot of the things already installed. I believe GQRX is, is there. And I think GQRX for me, as I said, everyone's a little bit different, but GQRX I think is one of the easiest programs to just look at the spectrum initially before you start to, to manipulate it in any way. Yeah, Cubic SDR I haven't got to play around with, but I know, yes, there are other fans of it. So, <laughs> like I said, everyone has uh, their own setup. Yeah, so they actually will generally use ISM, or our unlicensed band. So 915 is pretty popular, like the 430 megahertz. Uh, 2.4 gigahertz, so kind of like the Wi-Fi band and Bluetooth is, is up there as well. Uh, what? Oh, yeah, 5 gigahertz is also the new uh, Wi-Fi, uh, or actually new unlicensed band. So those are generally the ranges uh, that you'll see. Yeah, you want to be careful when you're when you're transmitting to have an idea of what the boundaries are for allowable frequencies and 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 power levels. Yeah, not yeah, as you were saying, not in the ISM bands. I mean, it's it's not a bad idea to have one. Um but yeah, that's where you have to just do your research and, and figure out what is allowed. But ISM bands at a low power level, generally you're okay. Anyone else? I'll, okay, go ahead. I mean, I would say that so far, I mean, from my experience, and it's admittedly limited, um, if I'm talking about a signal that's like encrypted to the point that I can't do anything with it, I mean, I'm talking about Wi-Fi WPA, right? Like you can see, you can see traffic and you can get information from, you know, packet data, but in terms of, um, a lot of these signals, I wouldn't, like I was saying, there's a good chance that someone has reverse engineered what little encryption there is on many of them. And yeah, it just, it, it depends. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah, so. So as you were saying, it, there's mostly it's encoding and not encryption for a lot of these devices. So any other questions? My favorite. Ah, uh, I don't think you're gonna like my answer. Um, I like Cali. I know it's not the favorite of people who do wireless, but it's it's easy enough to use and it gets me started quick. And that's a lot of the time what I need. Um, so the SCR Sharp is just is another um, it's another program. So the company that creates AirSpy is actually the same company that creates SDR Sharp. And I think I mean I was using it as like last year I was using it and it seemed to work all right. I mean SDR Sharp actually operates on Windows. So I didn't specify what operating system they work on, but you know, just know that there are some for Windows as well if you don't want to delve into the Linux realm. Though I would highly recommend, you know, looking at some of the Linux tools. So, yes, sir. So, yeah, an RF enclosure is a pretty, is, um, our screen is great if you have one. But, I mean, so we will generally use um, a Ramsey box. I don't know if you're familiar with those, but I think there's other companies that make similar ones uh, for some of the testing, if it's something really small. We also recently got an RF tent, which I don't know if I'd recommend that. It's, but it's, there's different, I, I can't tell you which to start out with. Um, yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Yeah. So. So he was saying there is a you can get a dummy load um, to kind of prevent any strong emanation, emanations from you know beyond your house or where you are. Any other questions? Uh, no, I'm not. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, I think unless anyone else has any more questions, that we'll probably end early. Oh, we have one more question. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So Z-Wave and Zigbee, um, I haven't yet gotten to that. We have an IoT lab, and we're building it up. Um, we started with what ended up being a proprietary protocol. Um, but we have some devices, and I think uh, for specific, I think there's the Raze, Raven, is it Raven or Razor for Zigbee? Okay, I don't know if anyone knows, but there are specific devices if you were to do a Google search for um, receiving those. And, and like I, I mentioned before, early on in the talk, there are, t there are actually like packages for GNU Radio and, and other SDR uh, environments to work with those. It just depends on how much, it, it can be a learning experience to do that. So you can buy specific hardware or you can try to do it via SDR. And I do know that there are packages for Zigbee. Um, I think it's Killerbee is one of them. Mm 
Yeah, so a lot of the wireless protocols, because um, over the years, it's, it's kind of that, what is it, security through obscurity. So they assume that because the protocol has to be reverse engineered, that it's a lot harder to, to kind of crack it or reverse engineer it than it is. And with SDR and SDR proliferation and, and, you know, the speeds are increasing and the capability is increasing pretty, pretty rapidly. Uh, we're finding out that, yeah, so decisions made in the past about, you know, this is safe. Uh, or may not have been the, the best decision. I can tell you that the protocol that I used as an example was kind of an older protocol, right? And, and they just, they thought, yeah, this, this is fine. Like, replay for whatever reason didn't, you know, strike them as a problem. So, things like that, uh, definitely occur. And so, yes, so they try to hide behind proprietary, you know, NDAs and things like that, but, as you're, I'm sure you're finding with even within the greater security realm, that doesn't always work. Yep, if there's nothing else. I think we're end, and, and I'll be around in the conference if you have any other questions you wanted to ask me. So thank you.